I just wanted to remind people joining that we will be recording this and sharing the recording after this event. So if you have any difficulties and or want to watch this again, that should be available. We will also be answering questions today with just a few minutes for a few minutes after the presentations. And um, as we won't, I'm sure, have enough time to answer everyone's question, we will um, be uh, collating the questions after the event and providing answers to as many as possible. OK, good morning, everyone. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to now begin the talk with a welcome from our chief executive at the International Partnership for Dogs. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to join us today for this event, but I hope you will enjoy his welcome. And we will be um, starting our uh, talk now. Just a little reminder that we are recording this and that we will be hopefully sharing it afterwards. So again, if you miss any of the talks or if you want to review them again, they should be available for you. Welcome. Welcome to everyone. I'm seeing lots of different countries represented and lots of different breeds represented. We are all so happy to be having you here with us today. I'm just going to um, start the talk um, for, with our welcome. In one moment, please. Um, apologies, I'm just having a little struggle with the sound on this. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Rolski, and I am the CEO of IPFD, and I'm leaving this message for you from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. I wanted to welcome you on behalf of our board of directors and our staff consultants. Uh, thank you for joining us and for spending a couple of hours with us to share information and learn more about issues that are affecting the dog world and specifically with health, healthy dog breeding. I apologize for my voice. I'm just getting over COVID, um, but I wanted to send a message to you and thank you and welcome you to for joining us. Uh, International Partnership for Dogs was created and started in 2014 as a way to bring together stakeholders and to harness their strengths and facilitate co collaboration. And the International Partnership for Dogs is a non-for-profit organization leading a global multi-stakeholder effort to address issues affecting dog health well-being and welfare. All of those are important to all of us. That's why you're here today. We collect, we collate, we clarify, and we create resources to provide evidence-based information and expert opinion on a broad range of issues affecting dog health, well-being, and welfare. We share this information through our online channels, Dog well Net, and our social media channels. We hope that you use the resources that we have available if you would, I'd like to send out an invitation. If you'd like to get more involved or have your kennel club become a contributing member of IPFD to reach out to us, there'll be information at the end of the webinar about ways to contact us. If you would like to get more involved in activities with IPFD in the Oceania area, please reach out also. We'd love to hear from you and we'd love to work with you on some new programming and new webinars. Again, thank you very much for joining us. And I wanted to hope that you have a great couple of hours sharing information and learning. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us today. I um, I also want to share the welcome and I am so excited to be introducing our first speaker of the day, Myrna Shibales, who many of you may know already. I know that she has a wonderful reputation preceding her and we are so grateful that she is able to join us for today's event. Um, I'm just going to do a little reminder that we will have a few minutes immediately after Myrna's talk for some questions, but I'm sure that we will not be 
be able to answer them all in the time. So please do use the um, text uh, chat or the meeting chat to ask any questions. Our uh, helper Katerina Mackey will be trying to keep an eye on those questions and um, we will either pro provide them to Marina today or we will collate that information after the talk to share uh, answers to those questions at a later time. So Marina, thank you very, very much again. If you'd like to go ahead and share your screen for your talk, uh, I'm we're all excited to be um, uh, hearing your your talk today. You see it? I'm I'm not actually seeing wait, your wait, screen. Wait. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm still trying to You're making me crazy. <laughs> it's always challenging having uh, international meetings. I am not technologically. Is it is it up? I'm still not seeing your meeting if or, or your um, presentation. Oh, no. Why? I don't know why. If you would like, Myrna, I have um, your presentation ready and I can move your slides for you if that would be helpful. I think so, because I think <laughs> okay. I'm getting not lost. Not to worry. No worries at all. I'm going to um, just open that up now. Good. And okay. uh, put it on the, slide, on the slideshow. Yes, one moment, please. Oh. There we go. And just let me know when you want me to move forward, Myrna, and I will be happy to do so. I will give you a click when, for moving the slide. OK? OK. Uh-huh. Easiest. OK. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, this is a, a, a very short uh, lecture. So it's just like touching the tip of the iceberg, but I hope that uh, it will be helpful and that you will enjoy it. Okay, so we're talking basically about plant breeding, not just uh, general breeding. Why? There are many reasons for breeding. A few of the reasons that I often hear from people are, I want to make money. I need to cover expenses and have a profit over all that the dogs have cost me. My kids should see the wonders of birth and life. I love my dog so much, I want another dog just like her. Every bitch must have a litter and every male must have sex. My dog is pedigreed and registered, so it must be of breeding quality. There is so much that is untrue or mistaken in these comments that there's simply not enough time now to list them. These are some of the reasons we have so many dogs that are substandard, that are seriously problematic, and that contribute to the huge overpopulation of unwanted abandoned and shelter dogs. The only valid reason for breeding is a desire to produce a new generation that is superior in as many ways as possible to its ancestors in conformation, temperament, health, functionality, behavior, trainability, and so on. We must use all possible tools to achieve this, including analysis of phenotype of dogs, genotype, pedigree, health test, temperament test, working tests of the dogs themselves, and of as many of their relations as possible. In order to make correct breeding decisions, one of the most absolutely important factors is to decide in advance just what our purpose in breeding is. Is my primary goal to breed a top show dog, a sport dog, a working dog for whatever work is the profession of my breed, a dog that will provide assistance to people with disabilities or problems, a companion and pet? What result do I want to have? 
It is essential to determine exactly what characteristics I need to fulfill my purpose. I must analyze my purpose and what characteristics I need to fulfill it. It is also essential to be realistic, to impartially analyze the dogs involved, to be able to decide which characteristics they are strong in and which need to be improved. When I have a clear picture of what I need to achieve my goals, then I can start to consider how to achieve them. There are a number of tools and considerations to make use of. The first and most important consideration is health. Whatever our purpose in breeding, true success cannot be achieved with a dog that is not healthy. Whether a show dog, a therapy dog, a working dog, a sport dog, or a companion dog, functionality is dependent on health. First, we should take a good look at the general health profile of the breed and the health of parents and other relatives. Find out as much as possible. We are very fortunate these days in having an excellent tool to examine the genetic health of our dogs and potential mates, genetic testing. When I started breeding, it was only possible to know what was actually observable. And we all know that there are some health conditions that cannot be observed until a more advanced age or that are not apparent in our breeding stock but can then appear in offspring. With genetic testing, a large percentage of potential health problems can be discovered and we can make informed decisions on the usefulness of an animal in a breeding program or whether a particular animal has the health requirements that I want. The next essential factor is temperament. Correct temperament is of utmost importance for every purpose we may have planned for our dogs, whether for show, work, sport, therapy, and also simply as a pet and companion, a stable temperament is essential but it is also necessary to have the temperament that suits the breed and the purpose of the breed. The temperament needed for a police or guard dog is quite different from the temperament needed for a therapy dog, for example. One thing that I see now is the desire of breeders of, uh, of, of breeds like the Malinois to expect their puppies to be piranhas when they're uh, eight, two months of age. This is absolutely incorrect. For a dog to be a good working dog, he doesn't have to be hysterical. He has to be reliable. Choice of dogs for breeding with the correct temperament for the purpose is essential. We know that a good deal of the temperament is genetic and it is then influenced by the environment. There are still a lot of opinions about what is more important and influential, what percentage is genetic and what percentage environment, but this is really not important. What is important is to consider what is the correct temperament for the purpose we are breeding for. It is a mistake to think, well, that dog is beautiful and I will use him for breeding, even though he has a weak temperament or is lacking in the necessary drives. I can correct it in the puppies by raising them well. This is a fallacy. Good temperament must first be chosen for in breeding choices, and then there will be a solid basis to develop in the pups. I've seen a tendency more and more pronounced in the last years to produce dogs with a generic temperament. Every dog, no matter what the breed, has to be calm, friendly, outgoing, ready to let every stranger on the street pet him, be happy to play in the dog park with every other dog, never to be noisy or show any aggression, and so on. This is, of course, dramatically opposed to the existence of breeds of dogs that are very different from one another according to their purpose. Don't look for a generically sweet dog. Look for a dog that has the correct temperament for the breed. Epigenetics. Epigenetics is the study of how behavior and environment can influence the expression of how genes work. This was a great revelation to me when they came up with this some years ago, and I, ho I hope everybody knows what it is. What we breed from dictates what we produce. Environmental factors can alter DNA, which can cause lifelong epigenetic alterations. This links into temperament testing before you breed and having a full, honest appraisal of your dog and your chosen stud before you breed. So you can match a pair of dogs that are fit for breeding from. You need to consider epigenetics to breed well-rounded pups. And this is why epigenetics is so important. So important for us as dog breeders to understand. Epigenetics affects how genes are read by cells 
and subsequently whether the cell should produce relevant proteins. It can effectively switch them on or off. Epigenetics is everywhere. What your dogs eat, where they live, who they interact with, when they sleep, how they exercise are all factors that cause chemical modifications that have the ability to turn genes on or off. Environment and behaviors can influence epigenetic changes affecting how a dog's genes work. I use the uh, uh, illustrations of people now, but it's no difference. It's all the same effect. Uh, this is incredibly important to consider for the dogs we breed and breed from. Health testing may have been on the agenda for dog breeders for a long time, but we need to be going further than that. The temperament and life experiences of both your dam and stud dog will have a huge impact on the puppies you produce. Assessing temperament alongside health is critical to the future of our dog. Epigenetics is a vital component of breeding better, more temperamentally robust dogs who can not only cope, but thrive in a human world. The temperament of your dog isn't testable in the way that health conditions are. We can't test for it, so we have to be observant, critical, and realistic about what we observe in our dogs. Statistically, the majority of dogs that end up in rescue land there due to behavioral issues. Uh, a few examples of the uh, epigenetics. If we look at stress, we can look at two groups of rats, baby rats that are nurtured by a mother rat and baby rats that are ne neglected by a mother rat. The baby's DNA is tested and epigenetic tags are visible on the stress re response, response gene turning it on. These rats respond very well in stressful situations. The second group is tested and the epigenetic tags are not present. These rats do not respond well in stress stressful situations. The offspring of the rats in group one also have epigenetic tags on the stress response and their babies have inherited the good, good anti-stress response. Whereas group two, the offspring of these rats do not respond well to stress because their parents were not nurtured by a mother rat. The rats that were not nurtured as babies had the stress response gene turned off. In this case, the rats could not handle stressful situations well for the rest of their lives. They also passed this inability to respond to stress to their children. So it may, and it can pass on to more than, uh, than these three generations. It can pass on for more generations. So the bottom line, is that we can no longer think of the sires of our litters as hermetically sealed vessels to carry genetic information from one generation to the next. Their care, upbringing, and experiences are important to the future of their children, grandchildren, and possibly beyond. This turns on their genes. It can change their genes, and then it's carried on to the next generations. Genetic diversity and preservation breeding. With the expansion of the use of domestic animals for a wide variety of commercial uses and the production of very large numbers to fulfill the demand and to produce them efficiently and scientifically in order to maximize profits, we began to become aware that it was necessary to consider the preservation of the genetic health and vigor of these animals. Strong selection for only specific traits and for quantities result in problems of health, fertility, and functionality. For example, Holstein cattle that have been selected for high milk production have low fertility, which is of course a problem. To restore health and vigor, vigor to their livestock, breeders can bring in fresh genes from the ancestral stock from which the modern breeds were developed. These old, less productive heritage breeds have significant value as a genetic reserve a living vault containing the genes for hardiness, fertility, disease resistance, and other traits that might be lost under strong selection. With the realization that the global food supply could be at risk if we lose these heritage breeds that are needed to restore genetic health to the commercial breeds, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations initiated programs to document the global animal genetic resources from which our domestic species 
of plants and animals were developed. They found that many breeds were at risk of extinction or already extinct. And in their place were commercial breeds with little resistance to diseases and poor adaptability to varied conditions. It became apparent that to ensure the vigor of the animals so important to us, it was necessary to have a program to protect and preserve the original heritage breeds. When the programs were set up to monitor the species and breeds that should be considered for production, for protection as genetic resources, the FAO worried about cattle, sheep, horses, chickens, turkeys, ducks, goats, pigs, partridge, ostrich, llama, deer, rabbits, and even buffalo. There are preservation programs for every species of domestic animal except dogs. In many parts of the world, dogs of the resilient heritage livestock guardian breeds are essential for herding, for protecting and managing stock and for protecting stock from predators without the necessity of killing the predator. In many parts of the world, the success of animal agriculture depends on dogs. Dogs are also very necessary for military and police work, therapy and service work, detection of drugs, cancer and more, and an endless list of additional ways they serve us. We should be valuing and protecting the dog breeds that have been developed for these specific tasks, as well as the populations of dogs from which all breeds are derived. There have developed some outstanding programs of preservation for breeds of dogs that are in danger of extinction. One program has, develop, has been developed in Norway and Finland to protect and preserve some of the indigenous Nordic breeds that have very small populations and have gone through multiple bottlenecks, leaving them vulnerable to inbreeding and loss of genetic diversity. The project is a collaboration that includes scientists from Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, and Iceland, working together to assess the genetic health of the breeds, develop programs to restore improv impoverished gene pools as necessary, and build an infrastructure to support development programs for sustainable breeding. One example is the program to rescue the Norwegian Lundehund from extinction. The Lundehund is an iconic Norwegian breed that was used to hunt for puffins, which were essential, essential for survival over the cruel northern winters. But when puffin hunting was banned, the dogs were no longer useful and just more mouths to feed. The population declined barely survived the distemper out outbreak and finally dwindled to only a half dozen mostly related dogs. A breeding program was started to save the breed from extinction and all Lundehund surviving today are descendants of those few dogs. But inbreeding has resulted in high puppy mortality and also a gastrointestinal malady, uh, Lundehund syndrome, that is often fatal. The breed has very small numbers and the lowest genetic diversity of any dog breed. In 2013, the Norwegian Lundehund Club and the scientists involved in the Nordic, Nordic dog breed program drafted a plan to outcross the Lundehund with the goals of preserving as much of the existing gene pool as possible and adding genetic diversity that it would improve health and reproduction. So far, five breedings have resulted in only two litters and a total of eight puppies. The battle to save this breed will clearly be uphill, but the effort has begun and none too soon. Here we see pictures of a Lundehund, the first gener that was crossed to a Norwegian Buhund, and some of the offspring, which we see are not very far from what the Lundehund, the original Lundos, Lundehund was, and continued breeding back will uh, increase the similarity until there is no difference. Is this a breed worth protecting? The Norwegians and the scientists certainly think so. How many other breeds of dogs are sliding down the slippery slope towards extinction as a result of small population size, inbreeding, and genetic disease? We don't really know. But there are no global or even regional assessments of the status of the vast majority of breeds around the world, which number over a thousand if you include the many mostly working breeds not recognized by a kennel club. Should we be worrying about the preservation of dog breeds? Are these breeds of dog really important? I think we can argue that many are. We could go on and on listing breeds that are still doing the task they were bred for. Others that have gone extinct when the need for the dog declined and many that have lost their historic job but remain as pets and companions. Many of the terriers fall into this last category. No longer used for vermin control, they were found to be suitable as lab-sized companions. But strong selection and inbreeding have taken a toll on health, 
and declining numbers now threaten many of these breeds with extinction, even as they remain popular as pets. Perhaps our greatest concern should be for the breeds that modern molecular genetics is identifying as some of the most ancient. Uh, the original breeds, the pariah breeds, the land race breeds, uh, which were basically the origin of all of our breeds. Two land race, for breed, land race breeds, the Basenji and the Canaan dog are the oldest of the extant dog breeds. Both have become recognized as purebred dogs and have loyal followings among breeders. But the purebred populations suffer from low genetic diversity and acquiring more dogs from the countries of origin is difficult. In the Congo, which is the Central African home of the Basenji, war and civil unrest make it too risky for trips to collect new dogs to add to the registered population. And in the Negev of Israel, where the Canaan dog is found, the decline in the number of Bedouin herders, as well as programs to eliminate dogs due to rabies control, is making it more and more difficult to find dogs. I'm a breeder of Canaan dogs and have been for over 50 years. These two dogs, uh, the dog on the top is a dog that we brought in from the Bedouins. The dog on the bottom is a result of eight generations of my breeding. Uh, we, in preservation breeding, it is essential to keep the type, the original type, the her heritage type and protect it. And it has become very difficult now to find new outcross stock to bring in. I am still doing it. I have a litter now from a dog that I brought in from the desert this year. And uh, we go on with this preservation breeding, but it is very difficult. We should be treating dogs like the invaluable, the, the Basenjis, these are Basenjis from original and uh, some that have been brought in. The 1998 is the one of the last dogs that was brought in from the Congo. We should be treating dogs like the invaluable resource they are. We need to preserve not just the animals, but also their gene pools, including those of land races, ancestral breeds, and village dogs that are the living reservoirs of canine genetic diversity. Instead of breeding just for perf perfection and purity, the most important and urgent consideration of breeders should be preservation. The loss of genetic diversity over time can be insidious and genetic rehabilitation or restoration of a breed is difficult. Breeders are reluctant to make the best use of genetic diversity existing in a breed because it involves using less than spectacular animals will find it infinitely more difficult to consider a genetic rescue that will require crossing to another breed like the Lundehund. Genetic management for breed preservation will require breeders to take a long view that considers the potential consequences of today's decisions based uh, to say today's decisions on the breed generations down the road. I have seen that there are quite a lot of dog people that are calling themselves preservation breeders. This idea has become very popular in the last few years, the idea of preservation breeding. This is the idea that when I breed, it is not for myself or my purposes alone, it is for the preservation and continuation of the breed. Many breeders now use the term preservation breed breeder in their advertising, both to the public and to the show dog community, as an indication that they are firmly committed to the breeding of purebred dogs and all that it involves. Others want to preserve the original breed type or working ability for this specific breed. They can be people who follow the apparent desires of the original founders as to what is or is not desirable. This is excellent. In some cases, the idea seems to have developed that preservation breeding means producing as many puppies of the breed as possible. This is, of course, not the intention. If we want to consider preservation breeding in our well-established breeds, this would mean producing with very careful consideration puppies of the highest quality that embody the characteristics and intentions of the breed from its founding on as wide a genetic base as possible to preserve the intention and reason for being of the breed. Okay, now we come to pregnancy and whelping and raising a litter. There's no question that once we have made our breeding decisions, there is further a great influence of the environment on the litter. 
It is of great importance that the bitch is comfortable, calm, feels safe and secure, and is not under stress during pregnancy. Stress on a pregnant bitch will indeed have an effect on the unborn pups. Anxious or fearful pregnant dogs that are more, are more likely to breed anxious, fearful puppies. So using fear, anxiety as your main considerations, consider your bitch's temperament. Is she a nervous stress dog to start with? Is she reactive in certain circumstances? What is her environment like? By being completely honest with ourselves before deciding to breed, we can make life better for our, both our own dogs and those of the future. Epigenetics suggests that everything your pregnant bitch is exposed to can affect her unborn puppies. What she does, what she eats, where she lives, who she meets, what she's being exposed to, what she has been exposed to. The experience of your dog during pregnancy has a direct effect on her puppies in utero. Diet, stress levels, and her overall physical and mental health will have a huge impact on the puppies you bring into the world. This influence will continue throughout the period that the bitch is raising the pups. A bitch that is stressed and nervous, whether due to unsuitable conditions or due to her own temperament, will result in pups that are nervous and have problems adjusting and focusing. So now we have puppies. We are at the point of choosing the best puppies from the litter, the ones that we hope will fulfill all our dreams. There are important factors that we can see in puppies. Puppies are not blank canvases. Their environment, even prior to birth, forms them in their very essence. We must start as we mean to go on. When we start with a foundation of sound temperament and raise our puppies to nurture the positives they've inherited, we start them off on the best pause possible. Learn how to master the art of observation and pair your pups with their future tasks or perfect forever home successfully. So now we have the puppies, the result of all the planning, testing, consideration, dreams. How can I choose the one that will be the best, the most suitable for my purpose from this litter? There are a number of things that you can see clearly in two month old puppies that will give you a very good indication of what they will become. structure. It is important that the puppy is built properly and is functional. Don't deceive yourselves. A puppy with structural weaknesses, poor movement, and so on will not change, no matter how much effort you put into trying to build him up and improve him. These faults will remain and will interfere with his fu future ability to perform whatever task you've intended for him. Health problems are very relevant. Confidence. A puppy should have self-confidence and the ability to be outgoing and have positive reactions to what's happening around him. Curiosity. One of the most essential qualities for a good working dog is curiosity as opposed to fearfulness. We want a puppy that wants to go forward and inspect anything new, not, runs away, not that runs away. Curiosity is very connected to intelligence. Alertness. I want a puppy that's alert and aware of everything that go, is going on around him, not passive and uninterested. Persistence. An essential quality for a working dog who has to keep on functioning and doing his job, even if it is difficult and there are obstacles. We can clearly see persistence in a puppy who may try to do something difficult, like climbing high stairs, but is determined to succeed. The puppy that is persistent will not give up looking for a toy or treat until he has found it. This is important not only for working dogs, but for show dogs that must continue showing for long periods and not get distracted by the surroundings, or therapy dogs that must continue with their tasks. Focus. A puppy will, from a very young age, exhibit his ability, ability to focus on his person, the activity he is doing, an essential characteristic. An unfocused puppy that jumps from one thing to another in seconds and never really concentrates and never really pays attention is not so suitable for tasks that require responsibility. Courage and desensitization. It's very important for a puppy to have the ability to realize that something that appeared frightening is actually okay 
and to be willing to approach and inspect in a short period of time. A dog that runs away from something startling and then refuses to come close to inspect it is of little use as a working dog. Courage does not mean non-reactive. It means having the ability to de-react according to the situation. Reactivity to the surroundings, excitability, energy level. A dog needs to be active enough to function properly, but never so hyperactive that he becomes a nu nuisance or can't focus and pay attention, but he must react also. Independence versus social attraction. In general, a working dog must have a great desire to be with people and in social surroundings, not to be off on his own. There are breeds and tasks, some forms of hunting, guard work, and so on, that require more independence by nature and in work. However, there must be a good connection with his people. Initiative. A working dog should have the ability to make his own decisions if necessary and take command if his person can't. We can see this ability in puppies. Possessiveness, a characteristic that can clearly be seen in puppies and can seriously interfere with working potential. We have dominance and submissiveness. The tendency to these kinds of behavior we can see very well in puppies. Sensitivity to various things. Is the puppy very sensitive to sound, to sudden movements or unfamiliar sights, to pain, to different footings? A dog that is overly sensitive can be very problematic. There's the passive defense reflex and the active defense re reflex. Very relevant to many types of work. A therapy dog, for example, should never have an active defense reflex. Well, this is necessary in a working carrier. Active. The play drive. A strong play drive is a very useful tool in developing behaviors. Motivation. A good working dog wants to work. He enjoys learning and functioning and is motivated by a variety of things, praise, toys, treats, and more. The prizes that he gets are secondary. His main motivation is his connection with his people and his desire to please. This is also important and valuable in companions and pets. To conclude, there are some basic breeding principles serious and relevant guidelines that we should always keep in mind. First, don't take advice from people who have always been unsuccessful breeders. If their opinions were worth having, they would have proved it by their successes. Don't credit your own dogs with virtues they don't possess. Self-delusion is a stepping stone to failure. Don't breed from mediocrity. The absence of a fault does not signify the presence of the corresponding virtue. Don't allow admiration of a dog to blind you to his faults. Don't search for the perfect dog to breed from. The perfect dog does not exist, never has and never will. Don't allow personal feelings to influence your choice of a stud dog. The right dog for your bitch is the right dog, no matter who owns it. Don't believe the popular cliche about the brother or sister of the great champion or top sport dog, dog being just as good to breed from. Very unlikely to be true. Don't evaluate the value of breeding stock by their inferior progeny. Every dog may produce mediocrity at times, even rubbish. What matters is the quality of their best. Don't allow admiration of a dog to blind you to his faults. Every dog has some faults that we would like to improve in his offspring. Don't breed together dogs that share the same fault. That's asking for trouble. Don't be afraid of breeding dogs that have obvious faults, as long as they have compensating virtues and the selected mate does not have the same faults. Don't forget that it is the whole dog that counts. 
Don't be satisfied with anything but the best. Second is never a good is never good enough. Breeding is, of course, based on science, and we should have a good basic understanding of the scientific principles involved. We have a wonderful toolbox to work with, including study of pedigrees, line breeding, inbreeding, outcrossing, genetic testing, and more. We must learn to make proper and effective use of these tools to achieve the best results. But in addition, breeding is an art. When we breed, we are responsible for creating something. And the goal is to create something beautiful and special. Never forget this. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Marina. That was a wonderful talk. Um, I'm sure we all enjoyed it, and I'm um, I'm afraid that we have gone over quite a bit of time. So, if Katerina, if there is maybe just one burning question that had been um, <laughs> uh, said by a few people, we can try to answer that. And if not, we will uh, collate the questions in the meeting chat that have already been offered and um, try to answer those after the event. Is there is there just one one question while we have Myrna in front of us that we can ask? Uh, yes, hi everybody. I, I think we could take this question from Halima. Uh, it's uh, epigenetics. Does that mean that ensuring non-stress environments for our dogs over successive generations can create a better temperament over time? It can't really create a better temperament. The temperament is there, but uh, if we we can uh, if we if we have a bitch that is not uh, extremely nervous or stressed, but is fairly normal, and we have her in a, a low stress environment, and we raise the puppies in a in a top quality environment, then we give them the maximum possibility of developing the good side of their temperament and coming out as good, uh, manageable dogs that we can work with. That's a wonderful question. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Myrna, for your time. We really appreciate that. <laughs> and um, I'm uh, I'm going to be the, the next speaker. And I also hope that I am a good working dog and was able to click follow the clicker for you. Okay. I'm, I might, maybe I needed more training, but <laughs> uh, thank you again for your time and your patience with the technology challenges. <laughs> You're very really welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> so I'm I'm just going to um, share my screen shortly with my talk. I will be talking a little bit about what um, I actually do. Oops, apologies. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, I would like to introduce myself, I guess. Uh, my name is Aimee Llewellyn Zaidi, and I am the project director for the Harmonization of Genetic Testing for Dogs project. And this could be one of the tools, the genetic tools that Myrna was talking about. She also provided some other excellent um, suggestions. So just a little quick uh, comment about myself. I have a background in genomics and metabolomics, and I was the head of health and research for the Kennel Club in the UK for a number of years, where I built the health team and developed breeder-focused resources and collaborations between the veterinary community, the breeding community, and the breed and kennel clubs. I was also involved in beginning some of the programs that were um, um, part of the Kennel Club's efforts to work with breed clubs to develop um, systems to support conservation breeding on a breed-wide scale to provide the individual breeders extra resources and tools to help them make um, really successful breeding decisions. I left the UK at the end of 2016, and I'm now living on the west coast of the United States. And I joined IPFD in that uh, winter uh, to um, develop and manage the harmonization project. So the harmonization of genetic testing for dogs project was actually a result of concerns about 
10 to 12 years ago when genetic test providers were first coming onto the market and people were able to access genetic tests a little bit more easily, a concern about the lack of regulation both nationally and internationally in the different kinds of testing. So we worked as a nonprofit organization um, to provide information on different genetic test uh, providers at all different types and in more recent years to provide information about the genetic tests themselves and we are uh, not associated with actually selling the tests so we're able to just focus on the information that is um, provided through our research collaborators and um, other stakeholders that are both developing the tests and offering the tests. We also try to respond as best we can to people such as yourself so that when new tests are emerging or new research is being undertaken, we can reflect that in our work. So for today's talk, I'm going to do a lickety split um, review of the basics of genetic tests and modes of inheritance, and then spend a little bit more time talking to you about all the different kinds of ways that you can look at the multitude of tests that are available for your dog breeds or your types of dogs, and not only help perhaps choose the tests that you want to focus on, but maybe help you understand how you can provide prioritize those tests to um, really benefit your own personal breeding plans. I'm going to also spend just a couple of minutes talking about um, reducing the risk with the minimum impact on diversity, which Mirna also talked a little bit about, and just um, leave you with a couple of resources and information. So, for uh, what is an inherited disease or a trait test, and by traits I mean things like coat color or things that would um, not necessarily impact or have an influence on health, but may be desirable or interesting for some reason to the dog breeder. So most people are probably familiar with simple inherited diseases, sometimes known as autosomal recessive diseases, and that uh, normally occurs when two um, abnormal variants are inherited from the parent. So in this little illustration, you can see an example of a dam and a sire um, with a normal uh, recombination and then a dam and a sire where there is an abnormal um, or mutant variant involved. And many of the simple diseases have um, associated DNA tests. Those are the easiest ones for researchers in theory to find, and they are focused on identifying what this variant is and then producing a test that can identify that in your dog. A risk variant test is kind of based off of very similar principles, but they may be looking for multiple um, variants that uh, influence um, whether or not a dog is at risk for that disease or has that trait, or um, the test may only explain sort of part of why a dog develops a disease. In other words, having the variant is a risk to the dog, but environment or other factors could come into play. So taking this a little further, um, just a, a simple uh, autosomal recessive um, example for a PRA, which is an eye test that many breeds and many dogs um, have forms of. You could inherit two copies of clear, which means uh, you won't, your dog will not uh, produce anything but the normal variants and will not pass anything but a normal variant on. You get have a carrier where your dog is not at risk for the condition, but has one um, variant that may uh, be passed on to progeny, and then affected where two copies of the undesirable gene are present, and that is when both your dog could be at risk of developing the condition, and they will pass on uh, one copy to any offspring. For a risk variance, it's a little bit different. There could be um, a test that identifies a number of different genes involved, and it would be the combination of those different genes that would put a dog at higher risk or lower risk of a particular condition. So it gives us some idea about how we're moving uh, from the genes to the actual condition. 
In addition to that risk factor, genetically speaking, there could be a number of different influences about whether uh, the dog will actually go on to have the clinical signs or effects of that condition. But for breeding purposes, um, it's I shouldn't say it's only the genes because we've just talked about epigenetics, but it's majorly the genes that are passed on to the next generation. And critically, that's what many people who are breeding for health are focusing on to reduce the risk. Knowing which variants or mutations your dog carries gives you options for breeding for health, reminding us that uh, Marina's excellent comment that there's no such thing as a completely perfect dog, and genetic information gives you more precision in selecting for desirable traits and avoiding disease risks. So for dog breeders who have uh, grown up in the breeding um, not having access to genetic tests, they often had to do test matings or use phenotype as their only guide, which made that, that little bit more difficult for sure, and the genetic information simply is a more uh, precise tool for those um, risks or traits that we have a genetic test for. So what kind of genetic tests are available? Like I mentioned, we have those single variant tests and risk um, or complex tests. There are also some genetic tests that look at fingerprinting or permanent identification for your dog, which I won't be talking about too much today, and also parentage tests, um, which I also won't be talking about too much today, but um, are certainly available. And all of these different kinds of test types may be included in a panel test such as the products that um, Oravit provide, and that will vary um, about what is included both by who your um, test provider is and their own differences in packages. And so the Harmonization Project provides a list of the international tests available to different dog breeds and types, and we also provide information on those test providers. So if you were to um, go visit us at dogwellnet.com, you would see um, a searchable database for genetic testing where you can have a look at what's available by your breed or dog type. You can also uh, look at some of the diseases and tests if you're focused on that, and also find labs in your country that are providing the services that you may want. So just to have a quick example, and I hope this works, I thought we would have a little look about what you would see for the Golden Retriever by doing a breed search. And on the Harmonization website, you will um, find all of the breed associated tests that we are aware of and are provided by all different kinds of genetic test providers. This is not to say that all of these tests are important or valuable. I'll come back to that in a minute. And it is not to say that these are the tests you should be using or that you um, necessarily have to use all of them for breeding purposes. These are just the tests that are currently being sold that we are aware of. We also provide um, information about tests that could be useful for any dog irrespective of the breed and other genetic traits like I mentioned for coat color that may or may not be important to your breed and again that kind of genetic diversity or DNA banking or identification tests are a little bit unusual. But focusing on the breed specific, there's a couple of areas that I think will be most helpful for those joining us today. Besides being able to click on and see information about the disease tests itself, you'll notice that there are little paw prints next to the, the, the um, genetic disease, and those indicate peer-reviewed evidence or research available from the scientific community for the green um, paw prints. For the yellow paw prints, either we have not been able to review that or we have not been able to find any research available to say if it's meaningful for this specific breed. And you can also see down here a red paw that indicates that there is evidence related to the breed but that the test is shown to not be meaningful or recommended. So diving into, uh, there's also these little keys called a key comment, which will give information that's relevant to the breed about that specific test. Diving into that a little bit further, you can see that there are hey, these two can hey, yes. sorry to interrupt, but we are not seeing other than your slide. We, oh, I think you have oh, to. No. <laughs> OK, I might have to reshare. Oh, my goodness. OK, let me. Thank you for letting me know. Let me back out of this and see if I can stop 
sharing that talk. I was just chattering away, wasn't I? I will stop sharing that talk and I will reshare just the website window and see if that will make it um, make that work better for you. One moment. I'm so sorry about that. And thank you for catching me. I would have just kept going and going and going. <laughs> I was just reading the comments and uh, questions and uh, I didn't uh, get it. Everyone was, <laughs> right everyone away, was confused. So. Sorry. <laughs> Apologies, everyone. I will I will backtrack a little bit um, uh, just to to make that a little easier for you. And I apologize, I actually can't see your comments when I am um, chattering away. So hopefully you can all see the Dog Well Net website now. Could I just have that confirmed? Yes, yes. it can be seen Yes, now. perfect. Okay, so uh, I'm going to just click to the genetic testing on Dog Well Net, and I'm gonna search by the breed. Maybe this is helpful anyways. Oh, apologies. Oh. I can spell golden retriever, but my fingers are not working. Now this will hopefully make a little more sense. So you should now be able to see <laughs> the um, tests that are associated with the golden retriever, as I mentioned, that were are available um, from various genetic test providers. Um, tests that are available to any dog irrespective of breed and some other genetic trait tests that are maybe not related to health but are important perhaps to the breeder and also parentage and other um, genetic testing uh, uh, tools. So again going back to focus you'll notice um, for the golden retriever that there are as I mentioned, these little green paws that indicate whether research is available or not. A yellow paw, either that there is no research available or we haven't evaluated it yet. And then a red paw that indicates the test is not meaningful or recommended um, for the breed. There's also an orange paw that is a little bit of a hinterland um, example, but that's not on here today. And you will also see for some of these that the, this uh, test has a key comment, and that means that there's something that is related to this test and breed specific that is important to know. So going back to this congenital myasthenic syndrome, um, you'll notice that there are there is one here that has a yellow paw, which means that the um, research is not available or has not been evaluated yet, or we are not sure if it's meaningful for the breed. And then the red paw indicating it's not recommended. So if you were to click onto the red paw, um, you would be able to see that, oops, this is actually for the Jack Russell Terrier, even though the test name is the same, the CMS. And as you scroll down a little bit further, you will have access to information about the mutations and um, the peer reviewed research that developed this test, some information about the symptoms that are associated with the test. And you'll see this key comment that it is this mutation is incorrectly associated with golden retrievers. If you scroll down a little bit further, you'll see that that is reiterated and that gives you some information about maybe this is not the test for you. If you go back again, you'll see the other CMS with a yellow. And if you click on that, you think, well, gosh, this looks like it is for um, the golden retriever. I wonder why it has a yellow paw print. If you scroll down a little bit, you can see within the details, again, some information about it, but the key comment in this case indicates that this test or this mutation has only ever been associated with one specific breeding line of golden retrievers and that it's under current research investigation. So while there is some research available, it maybe is indicating that this is not a breed-wide problem and you may or may not want to use this test, but it could give you a clue about whether you would want to prioritize it as breeding factor or breeding own breed. More detail here. Return release that are, oh, oh no. <laughs> oh, good, okay. <laughs> if we go back to those tests that are available, the, the green ones as an example. I'll just go for this ichthyosis. Um, there are a number of different laboratories that provide um, 
and uh, the original research, and you can all research associated with the different information that may be a little um, can comment that this is known and that there's also some information that um, it can be clinically misdiagnosed. So this could all be helpful for a golden retriever when they are prioritizing not only what have undertaken uh, for their breed, and uh, but also when they have those test results, what um, may be more important or uh, more of a priority for their decision making. So I'm just going to try to seamlessly, she says optimistically, leap back to my talk. I mean, that might, are we there? Did I do that seamlessly? Maybe I did. <laughs> seamless ish. Seems so, um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry, um, the writer specific research, some indication about what is available, all information has information. So, an example there is the MDR be familiar with and in that case <clears throat> irrespective of the breed that is using that the researchers have information about how can be we also have other resources IPFD including different countries prioritizing prioritizations for various health tests and Time is going on. I'm going to try to be efficient. Test result. Um, the example in front of you is a very might get if you're doing a, a, a um, doing a panel test uh, such as the products provided by Orvet. You're more likely to have kind of to a lot more detail different uh, tetra. Hey, Amen. <laughs> Sorry Maybe to interrupt say, again. Yeah, yeah we are having no, audio okay. issues. Mm -hmm. So Amy, you're just sort of got dropping in and out. We're sort of catching only parts of the conversation, so. Maybe it could help Am if I you clear? turned Am your I camera off. Now? Yeah, the screen okay. part of Okay. Um, let me see if I can do that. It seems that there the will. connection is unsteady. Or how about that? Is that a little? Is that a little better? Could be. I'm it hoping is. that's a little better. Okay. It's um, for anyone who hasn't done the calculation, it's um, 2.30 in the mornings where I am living. So maybe my internet is not awake yet. <laughs> um, if you can still hear me, hopefully, and maybe I'll slow down a little bit. It is um, better if now. If you are more commonly, what is available are panel tests, in which case you may be um, for the tests that you have undertaken. But what is really important is that understanding the results is key to preventing the spread of a specific condition and also that just breeding from clear dogs is not only not always going to be possible, it may not be desirable. Again, going back to Marina's comment about there not being such a thing as a completely perfect dog. So what I would hope someone would have included on their test results, whether from a panel test or from an individual certificate, is ideally you should see um, the name of the test, I, hopefully with a link to further information. Um, you should be able to access the name of the gene and the mutation and the research or the inheritance either from your test provider or you can also look on HGTD. And this may not be on your specific um, result or certificate, but you should be able to request or find that information somehow. 
It should also confirm your breed if you happen to have a dog that's a specific breed and the gender and the name of your dog and um, a result. This is all just to make sure that everyone is um, getting the results for the dog that they are all thinking it's from. If you were to get a result that said sex male and your dog's name is Betty, then maybe a swab was taken incorrectly or maybe there were some other issues. So all of this is helpful to confirm to you that you're looking at the results for the test that you want and also from the dog that you are thinking it is. You should also have access to or in some way provided ideally by your test provider, but again, you can um, find this on HDTD, some basic breeding advice um, about how to use that information. In Betty's case, she is a carrier, so if you were to use her from breeding, the puppies, um, if you are choosing a clear sire, um, you would have some that would be clear puppies and some that would be carrier puppies, but none of those puppies would be at risk for developing that condition themselves. <clears throat> for um again reiterating Mirna, it's always so nice when our when our um, presentations kind of complement each other there are considering the whole dog is critical for dog breeding there are thousands of genes in a dog and over one point or sorry 2.5 million SNPs which are where the variations in DNA occur that have been mapped and there are around 400-ish growing every year single gene mutation DNA tests that across all dog types. So that's a lot of things potentially to be considering. Critically though, a tested root dog is predictable and if it, no test results, don't assume clear, even if they look healthy on the outside. And a known carrier can be safely used and protects genetic diversity. And again, critically, many of the diseases of most concern to dog breeders and to dogs do not currently have genetic risk tests. That doesn't mean it's not important, though. <laughs> so I'm going to do one minute on, on population genetics. Are you ready for this? It's going to be fine, I promise. This is usually <laughs> scary for both the scientists and the dog breeders. So breed conservation or genetic diversity to create a breed, there is a level of inbreeding. In order to select those wonderful characteristics we um, are choosing for, then we are not selecting the whole spectrum of dogs. So that's not a bad thing. We definitely don't want to be selecting dogs that have health or behavioral issues, but it does create inbreeding. Any, any production of any kind of a breed results in a level of inbreeding. The more inbred, the more shared genes, whether they're the good genes that we want or the bad genes. And reducing or slowing the rate of inbreeding is really helpful in giving breeders more options over the breed's existence time and reducing overall risk across the breed. There are a number of online inbreeding calculators, which I don't have time to go into. Um, many breed clubs and uh, kennel clubs could provide those as well, but critically they require good quality data to be informative, and unfortunately that's not always the case. There are genetic diversity tests that are emerging, but they, are, they vary greatly in precision and usefulness, and it is really, really challenging to um, sometimes access and understand those results. They will, I'm sure, improve over time, but um, in many cases they are kind of in their early stages of usefulness. Ultimately, in my opinion, the aim is to breed for the traits that you are interested in and not necessarily the relatedness. So quickly going through that selection pressure I was talking about genetic bottlenecks. As we choose the dogs that we want to breed from, we put them through all of our considerations, some of which are very sensible like temperament or meeting the breed standard or DNA test results or HIP scores and whatnot. Some of them are maybe not such excellent selection criteria such as trends or fashion or maybe because the dog lives nearby. The good idea, the good um, uh, component of selection pressure is that you can reduce or eliminate known inherited diseases and risks, and you can fix more desirable traits um, in the breed. And the bad, of course, is that you are reducing your options to breed away from any emerging mutations or challenges within the breed, and the overall um, genetic population uh, size is diminished. So some of the solutions, we do have a previous um, 
IPFD has a previous uh, talk available on genetic diversity, and the number one way to improve genetic diversity is to look at the popular, the impacts of the popular sires. Um, I know that there that is maybe not a easy or popular, ironically, um, suggestion, but it is the fastest way of um, improving genetic diversity across all breeds that researchers have investigated. In addition to that, you can really look at the reduction of the relatedness between the sire and the dam using either those genetic diversity tests or inbreeding tools. People can use all available healthy stock, but again, you lose selecting those desirable characteristics, so that's not particularly recommended. In, interbreed crossing is what I call it, so some breeds have working lines and show lines. That could be a way of kind of dipping your toe into the outcrossing world without having it feel quite so scary. Making use of overseas bloodlines is sometimes helpful depending on what countries you're in, and of course outcrosses um, with good advice and good support is another tool should things get really sticky. Again, Marina, we, we are of the same mind, um, but one of the most important aspects to, to, breed, uh, to breeding, in, in my opinion, uh, irrespective of genetic tests or anything else, is should these genes continue to improve the breed? How much risk am I taking by using this combination of dogs? And can I reduce that risk? There are many dogs that have wonderful attributes that, again, perhaps they are a carrier for a disease or perhaps they have some other small aspect to them that is not um, really desirable. Understanding the family history or understanding the lower risk lines um, can help you to find the mate that will offset or improve or balance out um, for the next generations. And another, uh, particularly from a, a genetic testing point of view, good communication between the breeders and your potential owners is really helpful. One of the best ways that we are able to develop new genetic tests and new genetic test support is by actually identifying those dogs that have had, um, unfortunately, a genetic uh, mutation or a genetic disease occur, and that allows researchers to work with dog owners and dog breeders to develop tests to prevent or reduce risks in the future. So I'm just going to, to end now, and I, I know we're running a little over time, but I hope you can bear with, with me. And I'm not just a scientist, I am also a servant to my corgis. Um, so <laughs> I thought it would be nice to let you know that we all love, unsurprisingly, we all love dogs here. So, and of course, all, all dogs are, are beautiful and perfect. <laughs> so thank you very much um, for your, for your time again, um, unfortunately, because we just have so many wonderful things to say. Perhaps, Katerina, if there was just one question I could um, I could answer before we move on, I'd be happy happy to do that. And again, I will reiterate that we will have um, answers to other questions available after this talk. Any any burning burning questions, Katerina, or was I just too quick? No, no, the, there are at least two <laughs> questions, but well, okay. yeah, I, I'll take one. Okay. <laughs> uh, it is this, uh, my female dog has one gene of a variant and the male dog is clear. Her first litter produced all clear pups. Will this be the case most of the time or will there be pups that will have, the, will have her gene and only carry the one gene? Um, were you answering mm. that or do you want mm. me to? <laughs> yeah, yeah, if, just please, please do. If you have had a, a dam in a, a dam that is um, uh, carrier tested and a sire that is clear tested um, and you have a litter of clear puppies, you have been wonderfully lucky. It's just <laughs> you, so good for you. But if you were to repeat that mating, you could have some carrier puppies in that next litter. And just to reiterate that that's fine. 
as long as you're testing those puppies so that you know what their genetic test results are, they can be used for breeding or you may choose to um, put your carrier um, tested puppies into pet homes. As long as you have that information, you can make informed breeding decisions. It's not a guarantee that 25% um, or 50% or whatever of puppies will, will um, be carriers. It's a, it's the, it's the um, percentage likelihood that a puppy would be a carrier or not. So you've been very lucky. <laughs> how, how <Hey>, may, <laughs> maybe we could get, take this another, another question as well. Okay. There are only these two. Uh, with a specific genetic condition called Scotty cramp in Scottish Terriers, there's currently mm -hmm. no DNA test to show the mutation. If a dog or bitch is a known carrier based on having produced affected dogs by being bred to another suspected carrier, should all future suspected carriers be removed from a breeding program, given the aforementioned lack of testability? Um, so this is a this becomes a little bit of an ethical question from the dog breeder and there are a few factors that you might want to think about. I would say that um, in the majority of cases if you can avoid any risk of knowingly um, passing on a condition to puppies then you should try to do that. There are certainly some breeds where the gen, the gen, they are so rare that you might have to be a little bit riskier but again if the condition is life ending or going to affect the welfare of the dog it would be sensible to not take that risk to produce affected puppies. That's my personal um, opinion and experience. So um, it kind of depends on the condition and what the disease risks could be, and it depends on the rarity of the dog breed. So if you are in a dog breed that maybe isn't the Lundehund, <laughs> then I would suggest you perhaps don't want to take that risk. Um, the, if your breed is not a, a snow leopard, then perhaps you don't want to take that risk, um, particularly if the disease is in any way going to impact welfare of, of the puppies or the dog. And generally speaking, breeding from any dog that is unhealthy or has any kind of active condition, irrespective of whether you know for sure whether it's inherited or not, you might want to ask yourself those questions again. Be honest with yourself about whether those genes are, are really worth passing on to the future. So um, I do see more um, questions coming into the meeting chat, but we are just we're just getting on so much for time. So I will just reiterate that we will have um, some answers to any of the questions that we see in the meeting chat after this talk today. And perhaps we're learning from this that we want to try to build in a little extra questions time because everyone was very, very keen. Uh, I'm just going to um, put on my IPFD hat and take off my speaker hat and just say thank you so much to everyone who has attended today and thank you so much to our wonderful speaker Mirna and an especial thank you to Oravet who has made these talks possible for us to produce. IPFD is a completely nonprofit group. We are 100% dependent on our sponsors such as Oravet and also breed clubs and kennel clubs and veterinary groups um, around the world. So we really, really value um, their support in wanting to share information and try to provide these resources and information to our um, international um, dog breeding friends. And I am now just going to um, uh, encourage you to go check out Dog Wellnet. It's free to do so and hand over to George who would like to talk a little bit about some goodies that may be coming your way. George, it's over to you and um, I might turn off my mic and camera just in case my internet's failing, but I'm still here. <laughs> Good. So firstly, it's I think it's the first webinar that I've been part of that I've spoken the least. Usually I'm speaking for most of it. So look, fantastic again, Minna. I've known you now for close to seven years and every time you present, it's always interesting and engaging. And most breeders who listen to it are just really, really find it informative. So look, I'm doing the giveaway and just to let everyone know, there was a giveaway for everyone who attended the webinar 
and the count that I did was 207 is what we peaked out. So it's a $10 in loyalty points to everyone who attended. So they'll be able to use that towards uh, any future testing. But I am going to have, this is the fun part of the whole webinar here. So I'm giving away three full breed profiles to the value of $220 to three listeners who currently use us. But you need to answer a question. And the question I've got is, there were some animals that Mirna spoke about that she used as a demonstration of her epigenetics. And they were quite stressed. I need people to send me the answer to that question to my email, george at orivet.com. And then those that do, I will draw out a raffle and each Three, three people will get a full breed profile to the value of $210. But wait, there's more, Mirna, because I'm also giving away three full breed profile vouchers to those people that haven't had the Orivet experience before, that haven't used us, international guests, or people that just have not tested. So again, three full breed profiles to any new users but the question is again, a different question. I'm not making that easy. I want, during um, Mirna's presentation, she used something to advance to the next slide. Can you email me the answer to um, what that was? Again, three prizes, three full B profile vouchers, to three, three existing users and three new users. But wait, Amy, you've drawn me, there's more. I'm giving, I'm giving away more. <laughs> I just wanted to let you know, we only have about three minutes left, so okay. you're, gonna, you're gonna be short. This is, this is open to anyone. I have two fantastic books and you can enter this. It's the Australian Dog Judges Guide, third edition by John Bryson. It's a fantastic book. It's a handy guide, it's invaluable. It's got all the breeds. It's an easy to read format. It's really nice, two books. You've got, you must email me with the answer to what does H, HGTD stand for. HGTD. Email me the answers, George at Orivet and um, at dot com. Thank you again. There will be more webinars coming up, Amy. We have got mm -hmm. plenty yes. of people that have sent through information on what they would like to listen to. Um, please, if you want to look at what tests we have in the panel tests, our full breed profiles at orivet.com. Please go. The title of the book in the chat. Yes, I can do that. I'll put that in the chat. Sorry, Amy, people. So you go ahead, Amy. I know we're running tight, so I'll put that in the chat so people know if, what it is. I'm just Australia. letting you know, if this suddenly ends, um, it's uh, due to our technology and not because we're we're rushing away. But thank you all again for joining us. And if you want to see us again, um, then look out for more um, breeder talks. We are hoping to have Beyond Oceana, but we, we know that it's difficult with time changes for for our friends uh, down in Southern Hemisphere. So we're trying really hard to have more talks available to all of our international um, friends. So thank you very much. And there's my email. I post. People are asking me for the email address to send the, um, answers to the questions to there. Oh, someone asked if I'm on Facebook. I'm not. If you want to email me or contact me, please go through the uh, dogwellnet.com website and you'll be able to find me. No problem. Okay. Thank you very much.